battle footage in this program accurately reflects the existing conditions, but was not necessarily filmed at the locations depicted. was as functional as a surgeon's knife. Its real beauty lay in its performance. The B-17 was the prime weapon of the United States 8th Air Force in World War II. The 8th Air Force had been created for a single purpose, the precision bombing of strategic targets in the European theater in the full light of day. The theory was that the bombers would be able to penetrate far into enemy territory, overwhelming his air defenses and destroying his ability to wage war by leveling his armament factories without suffering critical losses. That was the theory of strategic bombing. In practice, it was not so simple. Trapped in the belly turret, one gunner. Some lived, some died. It was understood. They were a bunch of boys not long out of high school. They were not heroes. They used what they had to do what they could. This is their story. My dear little sister, in a way I'm glad I didn't get a chance to see your little home before I left, for it serves as a symbol something small and wonderful to protect and fight for. I have all the faith and confidence in the world that I'll be back. Until then, all my love, from somewhere in England, Harold. The sky keeps no memories. What is written there vanishes like vapor. What was once written there was an epic. This is the battleground of the United States 8th Air Force in World War II. A field of honor. In 1943, America was assembling the greatest air armada ever launched and ever likely to be. Its purpose was to destroy as soon as possible the industrial power of Nazi Germany. The 8th Air Force was based in England on what had been prime farmland. There were more than 130 fields crammed into an area one-third the size of Vermont. The area was called East Anglia. The farmers plowed, sowed, and harvested on the fields that were left, practicing peace next to the engines of war. Many of the Pilgrim Fathers had come from this part of England. Now, some of their descendants had come to help redeem it. It was not that they were super patriots. 
but they knew where they came from. They valued it. They were ready to defend it. On the night before a mission, the pressure was unremitting. It took all the devotion the ground crews had to keep the squadrons flying. The aircraft were taking enormous punishment, and there were too few. It seemed sometimes in the red hours of the dusk that the 8th Air Force was bleeding to death. They had died over places called Willemshaven, Regensburg, and Schweinfurt, especially over Schweinfurt. A letter from Harold Henslin, pilot from Wisconsin, age 21. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm riding from the officers club tonight. It's getting deserted. That usually means a busy day tomorrow. But there's a warm fire and nice music on the radio. Makes me a little homesick, I guess. Love, Harold. October 14, 1943, was going to be a busy day, and a bad one. The target was the ball-bearing plants at Schweinfurt. Destroy them and you stop the Nazi war machine cold. The Germans knew that too, so they made Schweinfurt a death trap. October 14, 1943, those caught up in it would never forget it. We had our usual rancid bacon, peanut butter bread, and coffee. But even in the mess hall, everyone was wondering, is it going to be a big one? Until the briefing, the target was anybody's guess. An easy one, a milk run. Or the other kind, the frightening kind. Today, October 14th, 1943, it was not the easy kind. It was Schweinfurt. They were told what the weather would be, where the anti-aircraft batteries were, when the German fighters might attack. They listened closely. They were professionals. Our CO would then deliver his little pep talk to us, and it was a very straightforward, very military sort of thing. His adjutant would add a few uh, cheery words, which I think were the usual ritual. He would say, good luck, good hunting, and goodbye. Everyone knew when you went to a place like Swinefort, you were going to, uh, you were going to really be in for a rough day. Rough days were not always the enemy's fault. Sometimes it was the weather. The weather in England was a bad joke. Capricious, unfriendly, a hazard. And it always caused delays. It gave fear a chance to build up. It tensed the muscles and gnawed at the mind. The weather made them sit. It gave them time to consider the odds. Roger Freeman, historian. In the early days, 8th Air Force bomber crews had a one in three chance of surviving their 25 missions. You never knew when the call was going to come, when the mission alert was on, and in a few hours, you'd be out there with a one in three ch chance of coming back alive. It's quite something to live with. I've heard it said that the life expectancy of air crew along about that period was about six to eight missions. And if you got past that, you were kind of making it on barred time. I was the only guy walking the road to the, to the mess hall, and, and I really did talk to the man, and I said, I don't think I can make this, you know. And, and I know I heard a voice, and you don't have to believe me, but it, the voice was, Carl, don't be afraid, because I'm with you always, even till, till the end of time. That made me go, man. I said, I don't have to worry. I'm protected. And that's strange, but that's, that's what did it. 
we resorted to magic, as I suppose any soldier does. You pick up talismans. If you do one thing and you come home that night, well, that's the thing to do, obviously. Whether it's the way you tie your scarf around your neck or the socks you put on your, your feet, one clings to superstition, and it's a kind of do-it-yourself superstition. You make it up as you go. It takes an awful lot of courage to do something if you're terrified. And we had a fellow who really and truly hated airplanes, and he was a pilot. Before every mission, he would go out and quietly uh, throw up in, in the hard stand out behind the airplane. Anyway, he, he always went, and he flew very well. sort of noise come down the chimneys. That's how we knew it was all happening. I think the first few raids, we stood on the doorstep and we used to count the planes out and count the planes back, which was, you know, quite something. The noise was something terrible. One after the other, I, I could never, used to try and count them, but I never did. And then, then after they'd gone peace and quiet, that was only, that was only quiet time of the day we had here. In every plane, ten men waited and sweated it out, watching for the takeoff flare. I was more frightened of takeoffs than anything else. I, I had seen a crew that took off uh, with a load of bombs and, and uh, they didn't make it. And they had 24 missions in, they had one more to go and uh, they were kill all killed. When you did get in that B-17, heavily loaded as it was, and you 